welcome to a brand new episode of Zeroing In. Our guest for today, Professor Rajesh Gopakumar, is a highly celebrated theoretical physicist whose brilliant work spans across multiple horizons, majorly covering the areas of quantum field theory and string theory. Professor Gopakumar did his bachelor's studies at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur and went on to pursue his doctoral work at Princeton University under Professor David Cross. Thereafter, he pursued his postdoctoral fellowships at the University of California, Santa Barbara and Harvard University before moving to India in 2001 as an associate professor at Harish Chandra Research Institute in Allahabad, where he was working till 2015. Thereafter, he moved to the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, TIFR, at Bangalore and assumed the role of center director shortly after the joining. Professor Gopakumar has had an exceptionally illustrious and inspirational journey over the years with major milestones studied in his career that very few were able to command. And in our conversation with him, he talked about the broad understandings of his field of research and the larger perspectives of jumping into science careers and navigating through the transitions and riveting questions along the way. Our discussion with Professor Gopakumar happened as a live session as a part of the International Science Week celebrations in collaboration with Shastra Snehi and Astro Kerala initiatives, which work on the science outreach and empowerment of society through the same. Your hosts for this discussion are Gautam Krishna, a part of Astro Kerala and Shastra Snehi himself, who is currently pursuing his research in astronomy and astrophysics from Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and I am Naman Jain from Zeroing In, the science podcast. Good morning, sir, and really, really, really happy to have you here. And I believe I can I can just start with asking you uh, this idea that we've been discussing over a little bit. So it's a general saying, right, that if you are able to explain a concept to a 10 year old, then you understand it clearly. But we believe it's definitely not true for, for someone who's doing string theory. So would you like to have a starting comment on that just on a lighter note? Firstly, let me thank all of you uh, for inviting me to this inaugural meeting. It's always very uh, heartening to see young people such as yourself with a passion for science and uh, for uh, communicating that to uh, others in your generation and your peers. And uh, about uh, the particular question that you asked, uh, that's definitely a, a very a nice thought. And in some ways, it is something that one should aim towards. Uh, one should uh, sort of uh, be a benchmark. Understanding, of course, is many layered and there are uh, several layers at which you can understand and explain. Uh, and uh, yep. so uh, both explanation and understanding can come in uh, at different levels of granularity. Uh, and uh, I think definitely uh, there should be a very broad level, which is perhaps accessible to a 10 year old, that one should be able to, uh, to at least lay out what are the central questions or ideas in the subject that one is studying and that is something that uh, is I think a challenge it's of course very difficult and I have a son who is actually now 14 but I have been talking to him since he was 10 or before about many things about the things I do so I, I do know <laughs> firsthand the challenges of uh, doing something like this but I would uh, definitely say for something like if there are any 10 year olds amongst you here in the audience I would definitely say string theory is a subject which is trying to understand uh, the nature of uh, what is uh, the force of gravity which all of you feel when you fall down or throw a ball Wh what is really the underlying nature of this force why is there such a force of gravity why is it prevalent all over the universe and how did it play a role in the beginning of the universe and in such extreme objects like black holes that are we know are there in the universe. So maybe that would be a very nutshell way of uh, at least explaining the, the motivations for the subject. And uh, perhaps uh, one can develop on that idea and talk more about what string theory does. But uh, yes, but I, I, I 
I like the spirit. I think you have to take the uh, the question in the right spirit and not perhaps too literally. I mean, because after all, yeah. if you really want to explain it, you would need to go into the more detailed and often mathematical explanations. Precisely, sir. I believe uh, string theory is very unique in its lying at a very interesting juncture, almost right between the abstractions of mathematics and intuitions of the physical world, which always begs the, begs the question, of how to explain this to the young generation of students because we don't really touch it in schools or even college courses so often, right? Uh, good evening, sir. I hope you're doing good. And uh, I would like to go back to your life. Uh, so uh, the question I would like to ask is, where did it all begin? Like, did you already had an idea that you would be pursuing this particular area of research or something or someone in, influenced you or... Uh, how did it all begin? So I would say that uh, I was always interested in uh, science and uh, in school. I used to, I think my interest in science uh, grew out of, uh, from an interest in chemistry, in playing with uh, chemicals and doing uh, various uh, fun chemical experiments at home uh, when I could try to get hold of some, even some day-to-day -day chemicals like vinegar and baking soda and uh, things like that, uh, starting with something like that. Uh, and then I think uh, the, the fact that uh, all of chemistry is based on atoms was, uh, and uh, the structure of atoms was something very uh, striking to me uh, when I encountered it. Uh, and, and then as I tried to sort of learn more about that, I realized that to really understand what atoms are, you need to know physics and quantum mechanics. I was also in parallel interested in mathematics. And uh, so in any case, I think around class nine or 10, I think I was uh, very clear in my mind that I would study either physics or mathematics. So at least at that level, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I didn't, of course, know about string theory then. And this was 1980. Uh, 384, 80, 85, uh, and, uh, that's a long time ago. And string theory, actually, it was 1984 that string theory really emerged uh, worldwide as a potential, a very serious candidate for understanding the quantum theory of gravity. So anyway, I wouldn't have really heard of it at that time. Uh, uh, but uh, I did read about it in 1986 or something in some Scientific American articles. But at that time, I was not so narrowly thinking i was thinking about physics and mathematics very broadly i i think uh, writings of uh, the book ideas and opinions by einstein made a very big impact on me i, I remember the program of cosmos by carl sagan uh, that i watched on television actually i watched before it came on television it was shown in the planetarium in kolkata which uh, uh, I had gone and watched. Uh, I th it was wonderful because they showed it six days consecutively, two episodes each, uh, six, seven days. So within a week, it was a very deep immersion. Oh. And it was really inspiring, uh, Carl Sagan. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, gotten to see the old version of Cosmos, uh, but it, it's certainly very inspiring. And I would uh, urge anyone to actually view that. And um, then I, I think when I was in school, I heard people like Roger Penrose actually had come to Calcutta uh -huh. uh, and oh. in 1984 six, I think he had come to Calcutta uh, and uh, in the planetarium again, had given a talk on black holes and so on. So uh, these were all very, uh, I'd read about Penrose and Hawking at that time and Hawking's result, uh, very remarkable results. And uh, so, uh, so these were, so I was broadly attracted to all these areas in physics and theoretical physics and mathematics. And uh, I think in my undergraduate years that uh, just deepened uh, and I still think of myself as a broad theoretical physicist and string theory <laughs> is uh, just one of the most exciting areas in theoretical physics I feel so it, it is that's what I'm choosing to concentrate on but I think string theory is a very broad framework with which to understand many things and not just actually about quantum gravity, which I mentioned earlier. So, um, uh, but yes, but in my early days, I think I was just very broadly interested in physics and mathematics. I had uh, uh, some good classmates and friends in my school years who were also interested in mathematics, physics, uh, all sorts of 
exciting things. Uh, I think uh, at that stage, one should not narrow oneself. One should just be excited by whatever is intellectually very stimulating. Uh, and then in college, of course, I had many influences, uh, very good teachers, very uh, brilliant classmates and so on. And I think they played a very big role in uh, in my evolution as a, uh, as a scientist. And so especially many of the teachers, I think it was when I went to IIT Kanpur that I really saw physics teachers who were passionate and really understood <laughs> the 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 basics and could explain that and could transmit the excitement of the, the subject and so that was amazing yeah, great professor one especially with the teacher really resonated with me because it was like a seventh grade physics teacher that actually inspired me to also pursue the area of physics so that resonated well with me yeah so i would just like to mention to the audience that as a trivia that Professor Gopakumar also has the distinction of securing the first rank in India in the joint entrance examinations in 1987. So yeah, as a backdrop now, I would just like to ask you about uh, how is this transition from a student who is, who is extremely excited about all these areas of physics to the life of a theoretical physicist? I mean, this transition into the life and how do you think your ideas got elaborated from there on? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question because uh, one doesn't know. I mean, at that time, one just uh, dreams and one uh, has uh, some, uh, I mean, very exciting thoughts. And of course, uh, it, it, each stage, the transitions are uh, non-trivial and one has to, going from school to a place uh, like an, un uh, an undergraduate institution with a lot of very good and very demanding teachers and students and uh, classmates and everything. That's one transition. And then the transition transition from uh, being a student to being a researcher uh, in your PhD, uh, making that transition when you are no longer doing courses and trying to uh, just uh, learn some things that are there in textbooks, but actually doing new things and thinking of new things. That's another transition and so on and so forth. There are uh, indeed many transitions one has to uh, to go through, uh, but uh, the life of a theoretical physicist that I'm uh, leading right now is what I always dreamt of doing, and it, uh, it is more or less what I imagined. And uh, I, I was, I think, mostly sustained by just my, uh, by the excitement of learning and doing so many learning and thinking about so many new ideas and concepts. I think that excitement that uh, is what uh, carries you through all the difficult periods that are there and difficult periods are part of life. And I think uh, one should uh, one should sort of embrace that. Uh, one should not shy away from it. Uh, that's uh, necessary in some ways uh, to grow. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that will happen. But if you have a thread carrying a, a thread of continuity taking you uh, so that you still are connected to that uh, boy or that child who you were in uh, class uh, eight or nine, I, I think uh -huh. you, you will not lose your way. That's a very valuable advice, sir. Uh, so I, I remember, I don't remember the exact words, but I once read in a documentary about, um, uh, not read, I watched a documentary in which one of the persons was saying, uh, uh, life is about carrying a message from the child that you were to the uh, uh, old person that you will be and not to lose the message uh, along the way. So carrying a message from your past into your future <laughs> and you have to make sure you you don't lose that message <laughs> so um, regarding your work of interest that is the string theory as a trivial question i mean as a basic question that i i have heard from many people if it's true that you uh, we, there are like multiple dimensions considered in string theory and if that's the case then what exactly is the physical significance if there is any physical significance for these dimensions could you just uh, talk about that a little bit uh, so string theory is a very broad framework, like I said. So there are many, so to say, solutions of string theory, many possible uh, avatars in that string theory can take. Uh, and um, uh, each of these manifestations, the simplest set of ways in which string theory can connect 
with our four dimensional world, at least uh, as originally imagined, uh, requires you to have a sort of four dimensional space time and uh, so, uh, something like six internal directions, which of course, uh, you, since you're not seeing them, they uh, have to be at a very small scale. Um, this of course is not an idea that string theory introduced. It actually uh, dates back to a few, some years after Einstein studied the general relativity. He described uh, gravity in terms of the properties of space and time. And uh, um, there were uh, these physicists, Kaluza and Klein, who realized that Einstein's theory can be generalized to include electromagnetism, that is Maxwell's electromagnetism, which at that time was the only other force, fundamental force other than gravity that was known. This was before we knew of radioactivity and the strong interactions and so on. So electromagnetism and gravity were considered the two fundamental forces of nature. And Kaluza and Klein at least realized that there was a very relatively simple way in which you could also get electromagnetism if you added an extra dimension, which was like a circle. And the size of that circle, if it was sufficiently small, so you could still geometrize both electricity, magnetism, as well as gravity, but in terms of now a five-dimensional space-time. And with one extra direction being like a circle, which uh, is uh, of a radius uh, small enough that you do not observe it at least in, of course, not only day-to-day -day life, but also in any of the current experiments. But depending on the scale of that uh, mm -hmm. uh, dimension, you, you can probe it if you are sufficiently energetic. And the analogy that is given is perhaps something many of you may have heard of, uh, that supposing I have like a small uh, cylinder or a small straw, then uh, from a distance, the straw looks like uh, a line. Uh, but if I come very close to it, then I see that there is one extra direction. Uh, but if I uh, were normally, it depends on the size of my perception. If I were an ant, I would be able to perceive the straw because its dimensions are comparable to my dimensions. But if I were an elephant, uh, then the, the straw or the, the tube will be essentially like a string or a thread. So it will look one dimensional. So even though it's secretly two dimensional, it looks one dimensional at very long distances or if you're viewing it from afar. So that is the philosophy of these extra dimensions. And so they actually play a role. And in string theory, in the simplest avatars that I mentioned, they, these extra dimensions, the, um, the novelty, uh, the, they are more complicated than just being a circle. They are more complicated, higher dimensional spaces, uh, but uh, their properties uh, can give rise to uh, many of the forces, uh, in fact, the, ideally you can get all the forces of nature, including the strong and the weak interactions through some of these geometrical constructions. So that is one way in which people were hoping to connect string theory to some of the forces that you know already in particle physics. Uh, but I should stress that in recent years, string theory people have found many more solutions of string theory. And I think it's, we have only scratched the surface and there are probably many other ways in which string theory can connect to the forces of uh, particle physics. And there is a certain constraint in string theory, which for a consistent string theory that normally would you, uh, you satisfy it by demanding that the space time be 10 dimensional, but that's not the only way it can be satisfied. You can have some other fields uh, turned on and in which case the space time may not be fully 10 dimensional. And especially now that we have realized that our space time is not really flat on the cosmological scales. Uh, it has, it is what is called a Dissiter universe or a universe in which there is a cosmological constant, a positive cosmological constant or dark energy sometimes uh, as it is called. Uh, so from, we've begun to, I think, learn both from observations as well as from the theory that maybe we need to 
think of a broader set of solutions with with within which string theory can describe the universe that we see uh, so so extra dimensions in many ways are part of string theory and if they are in the simplest way you might observe them if a string theory realizes these extra dimensions uh, as the way to get forces in that we see then uh, we may we may put, hopefully see them one day in signatures of these extra dimensions in accelerators or other other probes just like when you go down to the scale of an ant you can see the extra dimension uh, by sufficiently energetic particles you should be able to probe the extra dimensions and see other signatures of it so hopefully that will if that is the way that it, the string theory connects to the particle physics world then one day we will hopefully see it but uh, yeah uh, so it's very much part of string theory but but there may be other ways in which string theory may also connect. So I just wanted to add that caution that, uh, yes, yeah, often it is associated with all these extra dimensions and people are thinking about uh, things not necessarily uh, tethered to four dimensions. And I think that's useful because it opens up your uh, way, uh, the number of possibilities. And uh, we do not yet know, we don't have any evidence that the world is only four dimensional. So we, uh, we have only bounds, we can say that up to this scale, we know that there are no extra dimensions, but but uh, at the level at which gravity comes in, uh, the extra scales can be very small and you would not have measured them yet. This was a beautifully intuitive explanation. I mean, multiple ideas came to my head while you were talking about it. One went in, in the direction of, for instance, Flatland, which is this uh, small book that's written, which also talks about. And then on the other end, there is this idea of fractals that also comes up. Uh, that no matter how much you go in, there's this constant uh, recurring sequences and so on. But would you also like to talk about uh, perhaps any experiments in this direction that are already being taken up? Or is there like an experimental realization that is being worked about? Or how do we look further into the string theory in some sense, like the way further? Yeah, so one of the most promising, I think, avenues is uh, in cosmology. Uh, where uh, you might see uh, signatures from the early universe, which might tell you the kind of fields uh, that were there in the early universe, which uh, perhaps drove this initial growth phase called inflation. So those fields should come from string theory if indeed the universe did go through an inflationary phase and you see, uh, you, you would see the remnants of that imprinted on the microwave background and also in the large scale structure of the universe in terms of the distribution of galaxies and so on. So from these uh, very early signatures, which actually come from quantum fluctuations of the field in the very early times, which have been, so to say, frozen. Uh, and therefore we see still the effects they are frozen and they're magnified. So this is how we can see the effects of quantum effects in very early universe right now and from those i think we sh i am hopeful that we will learn as these experiments get better and better we we'll learn more about the nature of the fields that were there and how exactly string theory can realize those kind of fields because as of now string theory admits a large number of possibilities uh, and uh, mm. i think we will need guidance from experiment to know which possibility indeed is realized in nature and cosmology yeah. is one of those uh, ways uh, in particle physics also maybe through understanding some of the new particles we we hope will be there like behind dark matter uh, and even uh, understanding dark energy in some fundamental way might also tell you the kind of uh, these are all potential experimental inputs that can help us to sort of to tell us which string which avatar of string theory we really need to be focusing on to connect with uh, the uh, early universe so that's i think the situation right now uh, but uh, there is another aspect of string theory in recent years which is connecting actually to string theory 
as an alternative to what is called quantum field theory, which is been in a sense the pillar of one of the other pillars of 20th century physics, apart from the general theory of relativity, the quantum field theory is what has described successfully elect quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics, uh, the strong, uh, the electroweak interactions, etc. But string theory seems to give an alternative way of looking at uh, quantum field theory. And uh, I, I had recently given a talk to an undergraduate uh, meeting very much like yours, uh, held by students at the Chennai Mathematics Institute. And I gave a talk, which is there on YouTube called Why Strings. And I tried to tell why strings actually arise from the old ideas of Faraday about lines of force in electrodynamics. And actually it's a refinement of those ideas that are now also playing a role in understanding how strings can connect to quantum field theories, describing the strong interactions and so on. So that's another whole aspect of string theory that has come to the forefront in the last two decades, and which is one of the very exciting frontiers of string theory. Just to add that that's an area where I also think, because string-like excitations are very natural in nature. They arise in many contexts, like in the strong interactions or even in the electromagnetic interactions, in some sense, the lines of force that Faraday drew are really some kind of very diffuse strings. But in the strong interactions, they really become tightly bunched, bundled up into a real thick, tensionful string. Uh, and But it's there in superconductors, it's there in, even recently you see these vortex-like structures in superconductors or in turbulence. I think the presence of extended string-like excitations is very ubiquitous in nature. And so string theory is the framework that tells you how to describe such excitations. So it's not only in the context of gravity and cosmology that we should really think of strings. So that's one of the points I was emphasizing in this uh, talk for those who are interested. Okay. So, uh, Professor, uh, you are a theoretical physicist, right? So, um, when working on a theory, uh, when does, when, when can we say that uh, working on a theory ends? When the experiment actually demonstrate that theory or if it's some other theories which will be in align with the theory that you are working on right now and uh, should one keep checking on the um, consistency of these uh, theories now and then? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, so theorists usually try to address certain outstanding questions which we don't know satisfactory answers to uh, and uh, that may require sometimes building a new framework and that's what string theory does but most often and 90 95 percent of theorists actually are not doing exactly that they are finding new phenomena which which are unexplained and trying to describe in terms of already existing theories and frameworks also. So people, for instance, uh, who are finding very complex behaviors in some materials uh, or some uh, people who are studying the properties of turbulence, uh, which is again, again a very unsolved topic of physics, just turbulent flows in fluids, which uh, arise in many places, or people who are studying things involving uh, black holes uh, in the astrophysical realm, uh, they are trying to not necessarily build up a theory, uh, but use often existing theories to see whether they can, they are adequate to describe these phenomena. Uh, and uh, that, of course, has a dual purpose. Therefore, your uh, if it succeeds, that means you are, and most of the time it does, and uh, most of the time the existing theoretical frameworks have been successful in explaining some phenomenon that a new phenomenon that you see or a new um, material that you uh, properties that you discover etc so that is a test of that the existing theory like you said so it's a way of testing those theories and at the same time it increases your explanatory power of the universe and and it each uh, such new discovery kind of pushes the frontiers of 
your the theory, the domain that that theory is explaining is expanded. Uh, and uh, so in some sense, theories are constantly being existing theories. So I would say in uh, 20th century physics, I mean, there is the framework of uh, quantum mechanics or more completely quantum field theory that I mentioned that describes many things in both the, at the level of particle nuclear physics, but also uh, is a description for so-called many body systems uh, like in condensed matter physics. Uh, and, um, uh, and quantum field theory is by now a very powerful framework describing many different areas in physics. And then there is, of course, a general relativity which describes gravity at the, um, in the most sophisticated uh, classical description. Uh, and uh, you have to use some of these both in, uh, in say, astrophysical or cosmological situation. So you're all, all the time testing these two major theories. And of course, classical mechanics and so on within their domain of explanation where relativistic effects or quantum effects are unimportant. They're also being tested all the time by the devices we build, by new explorations of complex systems, which are uh, just complex systems at the classical level. Uh, so uh, in soft matter and so on, there are many ideas which basically use just statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. So all these frameworks are constantly being tested because you're coming up with new uh, things to new phenomena. Experimentalists are always on the lookout for finding new, interesting, unexplained phenomena. And it's yeah. it's always a challenge to the theory. So in that sense, I think you're you're almost you're doing that all the time and you're not doing it just as a way of like a in a routine checkup way you're each time you're doing it in a new interesting direction and you don't know a priori whether it will work or not but more often than not it works and if it seriously doesn't work then that's also a challenge because then you have to think of what it is that will uh, uh, will explain. So, so yes, so that's sort of how the interaction of theory and experiment. Uh, see. So in that sense, there's no end to the theory. That's a wonderful insight, sir. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I believe I would like to change tracks a little bit and ask you about the ideas or, or, or your perspectives about the state of fundamental research in India and, you know, broadly how the education works in India. It's not really so direct to see that it is uh, it is focusing on research, for instance, as we see in even in the scenario that there are most of the colleges in India are dedicated to science or engineering colleges. So, I mean, given that you have had these perspectives from a global perspective and over the years also in India, how do you see this the state and how do you understand this can be made better or or different if at all there is a change? Needed? Yeah, no, I think there is definitely there's a vast room for improvement. Uh, I think uh, the situation now that I see compared to when I was an under uh, when I was in school and going for an undergraduate education has changed a lot for the positive. There are many institutions like these doing science research and undergraduate teaching, the ICERs and the NICER, and then even many of the central universities now have master's program, integrated master's five-year program. Uh, so uh, there are, I think, many more people who have been also trained in good uh, institutions who are taking up faculty positions in many of these uh, uh, new institutions or new programs in existing uh, places. So I think the overall quality of undergraduate education in India has improved uh, in science and there are many more options. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think it's still very small for a country of the size of India, 1.4 billion. There's still the number of people who want to go in for sciences is still a very small fraction uh, because I think uh, there is still a lot of societal pressure to go into engineering or medicine or some management or some very safe option like that. Uh, I think uh, 
I think that should change as science should be viewed as a critical resource and an asset to the uh, the training of any person uh, in the modern world. I think, uh, in fact, our constitution is one of the few that is is the probably the only one that emphasizes the cultivation of a scientific temper and so on. So I think this was put at center stage, but we need to do much more to create that scientific temper, I think, in the country. And uh, this should, of course, start even at the school level, where I think curiosity is not often encouraged. It is not often nurtured uh, in schools and uh, school teachers themselves, I think, are often not motivated enough. So all these things, I think, uh, every subject has its uh, barriers, its learning barriers. And I think uh, pedagogy is about uh, finding ways to take people over those barriers uh, and in a way which uh, such that they don't get totally put off from the subject. So I think there is a lot of scope. I think there are many institutions, many individuals trying to uh, reach out to even schools and demonstrate the fun of physics, the fun of, I mean, through simple science experiments. I think uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, uh, has uh, had this uh, web page and his and a YouTube channel and so on, where he shows how with very simple materials you can really demonstrate very uh, non-trivial physical properties or even come up with questions which don't have very good answers uh, just based on everyday phenomena. So I think that inquiry spirit to get children to question <coughs> why things are happening around them, even simple phenomena, you can always find some very interesting things happening that you normally don't observe, but just teaching children how to observe and try to frame questions and, and having some channel by which they can ask and sort of, so to say, do research at that young level. I think you're never too young to do research. It may not be in the, in the formalized, channelized way in which, of course, the scientific research happens, but anyone can do research in terms of just questioning things, trying to find explanations, uh, both in mathematics, in physics, even in mathematics, you can play around with numbers and come up with patterns, try to explain them. In physics, you can try to open a tap and see how the water flows and do lots of things uh, just in your house or every day. Uh, I think that somehow I think we need to inculcate more of that at the school level. And at the undergraduate mm -hmm. level, I see a positive thing, but I hope it will grow. Um, so, uh, Professor, so I get asked this question a lot. And uh, right now I'm going to shoot that same question at you. That is, uh, how do you, uh, how does one justify the financial um, investments that, uh, that is being done, given into the field of uh, theoretical or fundamental or afro, so, so to speak? Uh, how, how can we justify these financial investments that is being given to these fields? Um, since they don't seem to be showing any direct contribution to the society that we live in. So, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fair question from the point of view uh, of, uh, especially in a country like India, where there are multiple needs and multiple, uh, there's a lot of uh, basic needs that our society has yet to, to provide for uh, a majority of uh, the citizens. So I, it's definitely a fair question and one should answer it. I think one way to say it, and this is what science has shown uh, throughout its history, is that it is fundamental science that has provided the breakthroughs which have transformed society. In fact, sometimes when I also get asked these questions, uh, I mentioned that 50% of the GDP of the United States probably depends on quantum mechanics. Uh, that if you didn't know the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, then you wouldn't have most of the industries, most of the things that right now generate, I mean, look at uh, what we are talking through this laptop, the, the lasers, the cell phones, the, uh, the screens in, in, in our digital cameras, uh, everything, this whole technology relies on 
the quantum mechanical phenomena. So before 1925 or so, when the laws of quantum mechanics were unearthed, uh, with, you wouldn't have been able to even imagine how to have something like this, how to realize something like this. So uh, it, it might have seemed that quantum mechanics is a very abstruse thing describing just properties of atoms. So who cares? But no, it, uh, it is the investment in that curiosity that has enabled you to do things and it continues to do, do things and perhaps quantum computing will be the next another new paradigm of computing and this again requires one to understand quantum information, quantum mechanics at a very deep sense. Uh, so this is not only something of the past, it continues. And in many fields uh, of uh, um, not only science, I mean, you mentioned specifically astrophysics and uh, theoretical physics, but uh, just before that, just even in terms of uh, uh, like even biology, modern biology arose from the fact it was physicists, uh, many physicists who, uh, through the science of X-ray crystallography, which was uh, used for understanding the properties of atoms, who managed to decipher the double helix structure of the DNA, and then the DNA and everything, all the genetic revolution. How did we manage to overcome many of the, I mean, the COVID vaccines that we have are products of mRNA, uh, they are mRNA vaccines. And so without knowing these uh, fundamental things of science, we wouldn't have had any of these advances that we we take for granted or the ordinary citizen takes for granted uh, and which has changed their lives, which changed people's lives. Yeah. So I think it's often shown that every investment in basic research sort of gives you five times that returns in terms of the knowledge that it uh, produces and its utility, even though that may not be the reason that you are producing that. You mentioned astrophysics. So I, I actually gave a talk in some places about uh, this recent thing where people were imaging these black holes at the center of this M87 galaxy and so on. So the kind of imaging techniques that were used to put together the signals from uh, half a dozen telescopes, uh, radio telescopes across the world and um, try to sort of uh, piece together. I mean, it's like you, you have just a few pixels and from that you're trying to reconstruct faithfully an actual image. And the kind of algorithms that were developed to do that imaging uh, to, to uh, get uh, accurate picture these are the sort of things that are going to have other applications. So fundamental science, and especially in things like astrophysics and so on, pushes the frontier. And when you push the frontier, you have to push many things. Technology, you have to push uh, your understanding of things. You develop new tools, which at first sight have nothing to do with even the problem that you're attacking, but which will be universe, will be useful in other contexts. The World Wide Web was developed by CERN as a kind of <laughs> way to manage the large data that the colliders generate and how to share that data in a very effective way with the worldwide collaboration uh, of physicists who look at this. So, uh, so this is always going to be the case. Once you have challenging questions, you will be pushing the frontier. And tomorrow it will be Facebook that will be using the image recognition algorithms uh, or someone else uh, to produce uh, better ways of recognizing uh, th things. You take a picture and it's very blurry, but um, you use the same uh, digital reconstruction techniques to, to make sense of them or to sort of uh, refine the pictures. So. It, this is bound to happen. And similarly, I mentioned about quantum computing. I think we are learning actually that there's much at the level of quantum many body systems we don't understand. And that's uh, going to be uh, another new frontier, which is where theoretical physicists and mathematicians, computer scientists and so on will need to come together. So 
so yeah, so this I think yeah. uh, more than justifies the investments <laughs> that put in. I would also like to ask some question from the chat as well, and uh, this one is a bit interesting um, from uh, Mr. Altafem. So he's asking how we quantize gravity. Will that complete the standard model? If you can make us understand the gravitation concept in comparison with other quantization of fields or interacting particles. Yeah, the, this is of course uh, one of the driving questions of string theory and gravity seems to behave. Uh, uh, indeed, the standard model is all the fundamental forces uh, except gravity and quantizing gravity in the same framework that you quantize the other forces, namely this framework of quantum field theory doesn't seem to work. I mean, people have tried it for 70, 80 years and it has not worked. And there seems to be good reasons to understand why it shouldn't work. Gravity has is tied up with the geometry of space and time. And usually when you uh, to, to how to quantize space and time is a very uh, it's a much more, I think, conceptually challenging task. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, and so this is why I think at the quantum level, gravity behaves quite differently from other forces, even though classically they all look, uh, gravity and electromagnetism look more or less the same. Okay, one is universally attractive, but the other has attraction and repulsion, but otherwise they're sort of similar, you might think, but. Uh, but really the deeper origins of the gravitational force being tied to space and time have made it much more, uh, uh, have really led to the, it, it having very unusual properties and black holes and things like that are actually the signatures that of the very unusual nature of uh, gravity. And um, the, so black holes, that's why are very central to modern day investigations of the quantum theory of gravity. Uh, and they're also, of course, right now, very important, even in the classical astrophysics uh, descriptions uh, because of uh, LIGO and uh, Event Horizon Telescope and so on. But uh, so black holes have been playing a very central role and there are many theoretical puzzles associated with black holes that Hawking and others had raised, uh, which I think string theory has been managing to give a very novel explanation, which seems to require that space and time itself are some kind of emergent concepts and perhaps not ultimately fundamental concepts. Uh, of course, I think these ideas are still, um, still being fleshed out. We see it kind of broadly, but I think to have a complete description of this is still something that's uh, uh, under progress. So, uh, but it is one of the very exciting things and that's one of the areas I, my own res recent research has been focusing on. So, so yeah, so quantizing gravity, that's, uh, these are part of the challenges of quantizing gravity uh, to understand how space and time our classical notions of space and time can emerge from an underlying quantum theory. Uh -huh. that's, that's quite an incisive take. Thanks for this. Um, as a final question, I'd just like to ask if you have any advice for young researchers and students, and also how you would see the Indian research scenario flourishing over the next few years, and how you would think this should be taken as? So uh, I would say that uh, to start with the last part, uh, I think uh, there are by now in physics at least a number of flourishing areas, uh, flourishing research institutions, uh, uh, and it's only growing. And uh, 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 I think uh, that each, each institution has a unique character and uh, it's, a good if, uh, it's a good time, I think, for people to seriously consider doing their PhDs in India. Uh, of course, it's uh, a PhD, if you get to do your PhD in some very good places abroad, that's also an option you should exercise. Uh, but uh, what I mean to say is that there are multiple very good options in India as well. Uh, and uh, so you should 
explore them too and um, and i think it's uh, it's only going to get better that way um, uh, and uh, depending on the areas of your interest you, uh, i think you can you'll be able to find high quality researchers and institutions the phd period is a little bit of a difficult transitional period from being a student to asking your own questions and I think you should have a lot of ambition and ask ambitious and big questions, but learn how to break the big questions into smaller questions, which are tackleable in the short, shorter time frame, so that you can build towards the bigger questions. Uh, so anyone who has that big passion for physics and wants to ask those big questions, try to cultivate that ability to break up the big questions into smaller questions toy questions which will build up your abilities and kind of flesh out the bigger question actually sometimes. This was Zeroing In with Professor Rajesh Gopakumar in which we explored some of the most winding trails of the frontier research that is happening in the fascinating regimes of theoretical physics and beyond. We extend our deepest gratitude to Professor Gopa Kumar for sharing his wonderful insights, understandings, and excitements about the field and the upcoming scientific scenario of India. On behalf of the Zeroing In team for this episode, we'd like to thank Shastra Snehi and Astro Kerala organizations for the amazing collaboration that brought together this discussion and also congratulate them for the amazing work they're doing. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back with a new episode next week, delving into the geeky territories of the marvelous universe we inhabit. If you'd like to listen more to such conversations, you can visit us on zeroingin.org or write your comments or suggestions to us on zeroinginpodcast at gmail.com and follow us on our Instagram and Facebook handles at the rate zeroinginpodcast for the latest updates. Until the next time.